Explore Pragmatic Institute's training to help your organization become data-driven. Our courses provide teams with the hands-on practice and skills they need to leverage data for business success. Visit pragmaticinstitute.com slash data today. Welcome to Data Chats, a podcast by Pragmatic Institute and the Data Incubator, where we tackle data topics and trends with experts, industry leaders, instructors, and alumni. I'm your host, Chris Richardson, and today I'm sitting down with Nadi Bremer, a data visualization designer and artist. Nadi works to captivate and engage an audience with the insights that the data reveals to convince them of the lessons hidden within the numbers and to take the readers along on a journey told through the lens of data, which is probably now more important than ever as we're sort of inundated with information. So Nadia, I really look forward to getting insights from you and thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I wonder, maybe we could start with a little bit more about you and your professional background. So for listeners, how would you describe where you've come from and what you're doing today? Yeah, so it's not very typical, but officially I am an astronomer. I graduated from astronomy. And after that, well, knowing that I didn't want to remain in academia after a while due to several reasons, but I became a data scientist working for Deloitte Consulting. And there I eventually sort of realized that data visualization was even more my thing. As a data scientist, I was always doing some some form of data visualization, but it took me a little while to figure out that true passion was where I, I got like in data visualization while creating more elaborate and creative charts. So then I eventually became a freelancer and doing now creative data visualization. Awesome. So yeah, what got you started with data visualization? So tell me more a little bit about how you made that transition and what were what were some of those challenges I can imagine, you know, coming into that and tell us how you how you made that transition. Yeah, so after about 4 years of doing data science and you know, doing predictive models, customer segmentations, that was all nice and fun, but after 4 years, you know, the yearly sort of talk with my my boss was coming up again and one of the things to think about was like what do you want to you know what do you want to do in the future and for the first time I couldn't really answer it's like do I want to do data science more because it, it didn't quite have that same passion that it had the first year and well you just kind of rummaging that over in my mind and I was going to a data science conference and there was a talk there in the design track and I just you know I sat there in the audience and his first slide of the presenter it said data visualization specialist. And it just kind of hit me like lightning. Like, wait, you can you can do data visualization as, as a separate thing. I had never realized that. But when I saw it, it just felt right. It's like, yes, of course, data visualization. That's that's where I want to spend my time. That's where I, I you know, work in the evenings to make the database for the slides for the present next day's presentation even better. And it gives me energy. It was you know, looking back, it sort of made sense because I've always wanted to be creative and, and do things in my my like my own time, painting and origami and whatnot. But I also love the, the math and just, you know, working with numbers and finding insights and finding stories. And data visualization really just combined the two, being able to be creative with the data during work time in a way. So that was, that just felt really right. I did have some challenges because this was 2015-ish and there were no data visualization courses, really. There was there was some great books. D3.js, which is a JavaScript library that I use a lot, was already in existence. It was, it was you know, young, but in existence. Mm-hmm. That was pretty amazing to me. So I had to learn. I had to learn basically everything. I, I read, I don't know how many books, all the books that I could find on data viz to learn more about the practices. I read about visual psychology. I, I learned JavaScript and web languages so I could use D3. And that was... That was a real struggle, but it was a fun one, though. So that was uh, that's how I got started. Yeah, I mean, okay. So for people listening who aren't into data visualization, I think it's it's well enough established now that people kind of know what it is or have a vague sense of it. But I wonder if you could get into a little bit more detail because I think some people, you know, they have all these spreadsheets and then they click the make chart and they think yeah. that they, you know, and they have they've done a data visualization, but obviously you're doing and thinking about so much more. So what are some of those steps that that you do that, you know, is lost with people who just think you can click a chart? 
So the funny thing is that for me, I don't think in existing chart form. So I really think about, you know, what is the data? What variables do I have? How big is the data set? Is it multiple data sets? And I think about the goal. So uh, what stories do I want to reveal? What insights do I want to reveal? Or just give an overview of the data and then also the audience. Who is the audience and what mindset mm -hmm. are they in? And from that, I really start creating, designing, sketching on, you know, a, a piece of paper or with my iPad Pro just trying to see like, how do I review these insights? So I work very much from a, from the goals towards a visual form, instead of trying to cram my data into a chart that I've just picked. So it's, I can end up with something that looks like a line chart or a bar chart, but it's always coming from a different sort of direction in that sense. It just eventually it appeared that the bar chart was the best choice from everything. And instead of just trying to see, oh, the bar chart seems good, let's put it in that. And it's all, it's also a mindset where people, you know, the, the general click make chart is usually, it doesn't let you think about it. It doesn't let you think about, is this actually the, the right chart? I mean, a lot of data can be put into a line chart. A lot of data can be put into a bar chart, but does it actually answer the question that you're, that you want from the data in a visual manner? Does it show you that insight? Does it show you that pattern in the best way? And that's what... A lot of people stop to do when when they have a chart. It's like, hey, this is a chart. The data is visualized. Whatever it has to say, it is telling me now. But that is so not the case. And yeah, so that's why that's also how that's different for me. I always a different mindset. The chart form is only the last step in a way. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting to hear how you approach it. And I wonder, has your thinking changed as you've you know gone in that direction, developed in that area? What are some of the things that have changed from early days to now? Well, I also sort of, I mean, when I started out, I was new. I was the, also the person that just clicked on the chart and then that was created. And from that, I was always just making it a little bit more extreme, like, sorry, more elaborate in a way. Like I made a line chart, but then I wanted to add something and I learned how to add that something. And then I had that experience and I wanted to make it different still. It's really this buildup of the experiences that is sort of like a step, each sort of new visualization was a stepping stone for the next visualization and learning how to be more creative, how to, how to let go of the boxes of chart forms and to think about things from that data and goals perspective and to also learn more about design and making it visually appealing, which is like in the field where I'm in, where it's really about these very custom, highly creative visuals in a way that are really meant to capture the audience. The design is also a very important factor. Like it, it needs to capture the audience from the moment that they actually want to read it or that they are interested in it and then dive into it and actually, you know, get to the information that it's trying to convey. And that as I was growing, that was becoming a, a bigger and bigger part, just understanding the design better and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And a lot of iterations in that sense also. Yeah. So it's, I feel like it comes down to just this, you know, ever growing sort of background and, experience that I can just sort of pick from and it becomes easier to pick from that and, and make things that are outside of the typical box. Yeah, that makes sense. And as you're talking about, you know, like your, your mental toolbox of things that you can employ to present information, I'm also thinking how in some ways the just a huge amounts of data being collected by most, if not all organizations these yeah. days means that there's to me, it makes it much more difficult to make a visualization or a, even a group of visualizations because, you know, if you have just like, you know, profits and time, that's fairly simple to to show. But now if we have millions of uh, factors that you can put into your data or your visualization, I think it requires a lot more whittling than maybe it used to. I wonder mm -hmm. if you have advice for when you're starting out with like huge amounts of complex information what are some of the tips that you would give people who maybe don't have the same kind of background as you, but want to effectively communicate that? What are some of the things that you can do when we're just kind of overwhelmed with the amount of data? Yes. Yeah. Let's go for by data is definitely something I, I experience a lot in my client work. And then also because I'm not even an expert usually when I work on my clients. So I have to sort of really dive into this data that I have no idea what is, well, little idea yet what it really tells me with millions of rows. And what I usually do is I see it as sort of building up a house of cards in a way where for me, like I, eventually I want this visualization to you know have a lot of impact, be beautiful. But while I'm 
trying to understand what's in this data and what, how to sort of find the core insights. I just go for the straightforward charts, really. So I have this data set and I just do, you know, the standard statistics. I create histograms of all the variables, the numerical variables. I make tables, frequency tables for all of the the, the non-numerical ones in a way. I try and see where the quirks are, where are the outliers. So, you know, I make line charts, I make bar charts and box plots and scatter plots if I think there's a correlation between two things. So I, it's each of these sort of smaller visualizations that I create builds up this sort of card house of the full understanding of what is in this data set. And through that, and I make notes and I make a lot of comments and that is starting to sort of show me What's in the data? Like the stories start coming out and maybe some an, like like nice anecdotes for some weird like outliers or trends. For example, with I had a really interesting data set of, I believe it was half a million observations that Hubble did in its 30 years, scientific observations. Mm. And there were so many like nice things in there where I looked at sort of the machines that they used to do certain observations. And then if you plot that a long time, it became apparent that sometimes the machine just didn't do anything for a little while. And then it's then then suddenly you saw like the bar chart started appearing again. And then looking up on Wikipedia, I could find specifically that, oh, this machine actually, you know, stopped working on this and this date. And then at that time, an astronaut went into space, like, wow, and, and fixed, you know, made some fix to the machine and then they could use it again. So these are these really nice things that you can that you can find by just making these very simple plots. And then together, I can, I can take all of these stories and then together create that into a final visualization. But it's really my basic means of going through a data set, if it's only 100 or if it's uh, 60 million rows, is the small little charts per variable. And it's in my mind that things need to connect to, to figure out those stories. And you'll get there. I'll, the, the bigger data sets will take you a bit more time to get there. But for now, it's always worked for me. And that's it. Yeah, it's interesting how you say that. So you are, you know, creating lots of little visualizations that are helping you. I wonder if you could say more about how the exploration phase and the visualizations you use there are different or how you know, like, this is a chart that I'm going to show my audience that's important, whereas this is a chart that I'm just using to kind of get a sense of data. What, what's the difference when you're thinking about those things? It usually is that... With the final visualizations, I want to tell more than just one tiny story. So each, each like each of the tiny visualizations, they tell a little bit of the like this full story that they have, like like that peak. There's just one one machine that stopped working and started working again. But there are so many different ways to look at that same data set. And for the visualizations that I create, I like to work with the bigger data sets. I like to have a visual that has sort of a main insight, but tells a lot of little stories for people that are truly interested. So for me, it's about figuring out a way to, first, of course, you need to find that main insight. That's where the, the little visualizations help a lot. And then maybe, you know, maybe the final visual has some sort of roots in the, the that first little visualization, but then I expand it. It's like, it's not, it started out as a simple line chart, but then I added you know, I split it apart into the subcategories and each line became its thickness represents some other value. So you get more into what we call like a stream graph if somebody wants to look it up. And then I, you know, add something else to that line as well, like opacities to maybe subsection different parts of the year that represent something else. And then who knows, who knows what I'll add onto that. And, to the, and so that's how something could possibly work to create that vinyl visual. But like I said, in general, it's like it's, it's about revealing more than just one statistic. So my visuals reveal many, like a main story and hopefully a lot of little stories for people to find. And what do you do for, for guiding understanding? Because I can imagine that, you know, in a, in a perfect situation, you would show them an image, any viewer, and they would automatically understand everything. Yeah. But I think, you know, that's not usually how it works. So I wonder, I know different people have different quirks about, you know, using labels in a certain way or using legends or, or not using legends, but I wonder if you have advice for how to help guide viewers. Yes. Well, the simple one in terms of, of, of legends, it's always best to label things directly if you can. So instead of a legend outside of the visual, it is indeed better to put the labels onto what the, like, what the colors represent, put them next to the lines, these kinds of things. It's also, on the flip side, you can also think about not everything has to be labeled. Sometimes I see that every like every part of a bar chart has has a number and it feels like, do we really need to have each 
bar needs to have a number. Is that truly the crux of this visualization? If it is, should you have just supplied a table? So it's also thinking about what is really important. What should people really see from this from this visual? Other than that, I mean, for static charts, you are more limited. If you have something that is interactive or a video, then you can go very extreme. You can, you know, have like a few seconds at the start where you build it up. Like you have the first color and you label it. And then the second one comes up and you label it. And then the rest quickly comes up and then... It's sort of you have some time to put annotations like there's like with the first slides, it could be I once made a visual about the phone brand. So it could be like iPhone. And then you say, well, this slice represents the the percentage of uh, iPhones being sold in the Netherlands. And then the next one is then, you know, Pixel. And then, you know, once the the others can come quickly because people then understand what it represents. And, you know, you can Mm -hmm. see the other phone brands. It's obvious. And so with animation, it's really easy to guide people into this visual. But usually, though, like it's uh, that's only like the like the point one percent of all visualizations made that actually have this sort of introduction. In that sense, then I would say that think about also how people generally read. So in the Western society, we read like left to right, top to bottom. So think about how you would place things that are most important for people to understand the visual. Place them like top left or top right. So their eyes have wandered over that so they can see, oh, there is a legend there if you cannot place it in the visual, but it's mm-hmm. there. And then their eyes go to the visual and then they that hopefully there's this reminder if they don't quite get it, that the legend was actually somewhere along the top and they can go back to that before they think like, oh, I don't understand this. And then they go somewhere else. Also to note is that it really depends on your audience. So for the visuals that I create, they're more for an audience that has time. It's not for the managers that look at the dashboard each morning. They have only a limited amount of time. They just want to know if everything's going well. I mean, for those, the line charts are super. They only need a little bit of mind power to actually understand if, you know, if the, if the thing is going up or down and if, or if that, that's good or bad. But the visuals that I create are more for magazines, for marketing, where uh, even for museums where people are in a very different mindset and they mm-hmm. don't mind having to invest a little bit of extra time to understand it. And that's also why it's so important for my visuals to really focus on that visual aesthetic part, because when something looks beautiful or interesting, people are just more inclined to want to invest that time to understand it, like this sort of little bias that we have. I I definitely can say that there are more than enough people that have, no, that cannot understand my visuals. (laughs) <laughs> but I yeah. know that the the ones that I make the the visual for, like uh, Scientific American or New York Times, like th- those people that read that and are interested in the topic that the visual is about, they will actually understand it. But for the most important visuals, I do the dad test. I show it to my dad and see if he <laughs> understands it. That's great. Yeah, I like yeah. that. And actually, it's a perfect segue to the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is narrative and storytelling. So. I wonder how you think of those two things, like an image or a visual versus or in in sync with a story. So are you thinking about a narrative story or I guess in your work, do you often get some kind of story that you're then making a visual for? How does narrative fit into visualization? I think you can definitely have a narrative, but and that's, that comes down back to that sort of uh, reading direction that I said. If you have something that needs to be captured in one image, try and think about the narrative and putting that like the, if you can sort of pull it apart into like sub steps, like what was the first step of your narrative and the second, like, can you somehow weave that into this sort of Z-like direction into the, the visual space that you have, but yeah. also... Sometimes people want to cram too much into one visual if they want to tell a full story. So if there is sort of a real story that has different points, like different statistics, different ways of having to look at the data, I will actually tell my client that we need to pull that apart into different visuals and then try and link them together in a visually interesting way or on a website or in an article sense, because you cannot tell everything always in in one image. Mm-hmm. And that is... Something that I do, I do think people forget or people hope that it will be possible, but it's, it's not always. And I know I just said, like, I like to put more multiple stories into the, into one visual, but I guess more, that's more like, it's like, not like a full blown story. That's more like nuggets of insight, these little things like, oh, I didn't know that about, I once made a visualization about all the gold medal winners for the Olympic games, just showing them, you know, who, like which countries won all across all the years and which subcategories and disciplines. 
And there was sort of a main insight where you could see like generally, you know, Asia's uh, blooming in certain areas and, and Europe was mostly winning at the very, very start. And now it's much more spread out across the countries. But if you look deeper, you'll notice that like these little things about how there is, of course, the, oh, I forgot which years, but the years where the U.S. was boycotting Russia and the Russian was boycotting the U.S. So you can see yeah. as, like a big change in the number of gymnastics um, uh, medals that were won that year. Or you can see the point where Asia started dominating table tennis and mm. or or that, oh, what's the English word again? That pulling a red for the team. I can't remember. It was one was an Olympic sport once, and it's oh, no it longer. It was Olympic sport. I was going to say, it, it, yeah. like, tug of war. Tug of war. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I didn't Olympic realize sport. it was an Olympic sport. <laughs> it's not. Like that's what I mean with these like smaller stories. Besides, sort of the main story, but it's like these nuggets of information. Um, hmm. It's not a full blown like beginning, middle, and end kind of thing. If you have something like that. And it really can just be better to pull it apart into separate visuals and kind of link them together with titles, with annotations in, in just an interesting way. Or generally with annotations is a good way to guide people. Like always keep in mind the Z, the Z direction of like title, most important part, smaller annotations at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you could say a little bit about creativity and how that plays in. Because I, I know in talking to a lot of people who work in this Typically, and I don't, I don't want to get in trouble, but I feel like the data visualization professionals are much more open to creative approaches, to artistic flourish, as opposed to some of the more like hardcore engineers who are, are very much doing the programming and, and there's not necessarily as much space for creative, especially visual creativity. But how do you, how do you play with that? Like, where do you see places where people could be more creative? And maybe how do you prevent yourself from getting a little too creative? Yeah. <laughs> in terms of uh, trying to be creative, I think it's it's good to realize that you don't have to invent the wheel always. You know, take uh, do like the steal like an artist, but not you know a copycat. I like yeah. the word remix. See what other people have done and take the things that you like from that and try and apply them to your what you are creating. It could be as simple as this was it for me. You know the. The first line charts I created were just, you know, these from dot to dot, line, 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 pointy, pointy things everywhere. And then I saw a simple dashboard somewhere, I think, and it had these curved lines. It was like, in like gently going through the data point and curving back down. It just looked so much better. And I thought, you know, yes, yeah, I want to learn. I want to understand how I can make my line charts look not so pointy, but curved instead. Like these these small things. And then another time I saw something that had like a gradient from the bottom to the top. And I thought, well, that looks interesting too. Maybe I can combine that too. So it's about these, these picking these things that you see that others have done. And then again, through that, through experience that you've made in the past. And if you are aware of things that you like and try and understand, why do I think this is beautiful? Is it because of this element from that element? I'll try and see if I can incorporate that next time. And combining that, that really makes it easier to be, get more and more creative. Sometimes I feel like creativity is kind of like a muscle. Um, mm. The more you try and use it, the more it gives back to you as well, like the stronger it gets and the, the easier it gets. Uh, you also get better at knowing like that won't work. I know sometimes you still have to try, but that gets easier too. And, but I definitely understand this thing where sometimes people get too creative. I have, I mean, for me, that's, so I have to pull myself back as well. And it's also why I have like a data art side, because sometimes I just want to go all creative and not really care about the data still being understandable. I just want to evoke a feeling and it's using data, but it's, you know, it's really about the visual aspect of things. And in that sense, I always try, I have this sort of mindset and kind of try and take a look back and imagine, this, this is not easy though, imagine myself at the point of, the, at the start of this project when I didn't understand the data myself. And from that perspective, what did I find difficult at that time? And in this visual, am I still taking that into account? Is this still sort of showing the insights that I wanted to, to show? Am I, am I still seeing the trends, seeing the patterns? And, so, and then if I'm, I'm doubting in that sense, I will ask, Friends like database friends or other friends, and like I said, in the most extreme cases, my dad. And if this is still if this visual is still understandable, and I will get some good feedback. And also, the clients always are a good sounding board to making sure that that it's still on track and not going too far overboard. They're still understanding what's going on because I do send a lot of 
I'm not the person that just, you know, takes the data and, and, and presents the final result. I'm very much sort of an in-between iterative process, like, oh, this is how it's looking now. This is why I did it. Do you have any feedback? And then I will take that and then develop the visual further. I wonder if you have advice for people who are maybe working with data viz professionals, and I'm sure there's, you know, organizations can be very different from one to another, but if you're getting the data from somebody and they want to present this in a use case, whatever that is, what's the best way to give it to you? And what kind of timing is often good? Like, what should they be thinking about? Because I can just imagine somebody saying like, hey, can I have a nice visualization by the end of the day? And that <laughs> may, not, may not work well. So what advice do you have for teams who are working with someone like you? I think knowing... Like if the if they know what the insight is that you have to have to visualize that is good. Like sometimes clients don't seem to know this. If you really dig deeper, they don't quite know what this data, like the story or what the visual actually has to do. So a, a team would need to know this specifically. Like what should this visual do? What should it say? What is the insight to reveal? Or what is the goal? And another thing is that I know that, you know, it's easy to say that put them at the start of the project, but maybe have a touch point at the start of the project where you tell them what the project is about and the goal. Because I see that sometimes it's about the data gathering. Like if there's still a point in time where the data being gathered is still in a fluid state, then if you can pull that data this person in, they might say, well, can you also gather this particular variable, which would be like a very interesting way to incorporate into a possible visualization if this is what your goal is. Mm -hmm. Or... Can you make sure that I get this data at the most granular level, like not aggregated? I want it like a per person or per like row kind of variable. So I have access to everything. And then instead of just the means and the averages, hmm. just in that sense, like a very quick touch point would be good. But then, then, at, then you can, you know, you can pull the, do your thing, do your data analysis. And then the data this person comes back in. Not the same day. I mean, some people can, of course, and there are definitely tools with which you can do that. But I, for me, my fastest project for a static base is about two weeks of lead time. My longest are three months if you want to like a full website with the interactive visuals and all the bells mm -hmm. and whistles. So it, it they, yeah. they take a, a bit more time because they have to be programmed and I, you know, I have to understand the data myself. So let's see, but it's brand guidelines are a good thing for me mm -hmm. to know. Sometimes I have full, I can do whatever I want, but more often than not with clients, there's of course things to keep in mind. But if you're working at a company, you probably already know that if you're like an in-company database person, mm -hmm. let's see. And yeah, just having the data available and giving an explanation of what all the variables mean is, is a handy thing to have. And being available, especially during the first like day or a few days that you give the data to that, like the data of this person, because hopefully they'll come back with lots of questions because they've analyzed the data, like they've visualized, made all of those little charts and they've found things that might seem weird to them to better understand. And then they, I always have like loads of questions like, why is this happening? I'm seeing this when I do that. What does that actually mean? How should I interpret this? But in this case, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. What about return on investment? Because I can just imagine that a lot of places, especially if they're thinking, okay, should we or should we not hire a data viz consultant or somebody to come in for a project? You know, I don't want to simplify, but, you know, return on investment is like the number one thing that people are often worried about, especially if they're paying for a service and they're debating mm -hmm. whether to pay for a service. Mm -hmm. So also with visualization, I would imagine that it's difficult to have like an immediate return, like a clear number that you can say, here's the return on your investment. But how do you think about that generally? And what are some of the ways to capture or, you know, convey a return on investment for people? Oh, yeah, that is a very tricky one. Yeah, it's not like a button where you can say like how many people were here and how many clicked on it. But, you know, there are ways to kind of capture the importance of visualizations. If you show a person a table of numbers, they will not be able to tell you within a fraction of a second what, you know, if it's like numbers about growth of a company and different product lines, they won't tell you, won't be able to tell you which ones are going up, which ones are doing well, which ones are bad, which ones is the best at mm -hmm. this point in time. But if you put that into a line chart, they will be able to answer all of those questions within having seen it for just, you know, a few seconds. And they will also be able to probably tell you that a day later, because we are very visual beings. We remember things in, in images and stories, and we are not number, like computers are number creatures. We are not numbered creatures. Yeah. So uh, visualizations just have, can create such a bigger impact in understanding data 
remembering data. So if you know if those if you have something like important to say about data, making it into a visualization is like there's hardly any downsides to it. I would say unless there is some conclusion that you don't want the in the data that you never expected. But anyway, tangent. But it's really hard to say like what the exact return on investment is. For my visuals, it's usually basically impossible. I'm like part of like one visual in a magazine that's mine. Who knows like how many extra sales came from that, if any. But there was one other project where it was a really a big project about how with a, the Guardian, the US version of the Guardian, which is a newspaper, and they were doing a story about homeless people and, and bus tickets and single way bus tickets that cities mm. were giving out for them to move away. And it was very, very uh, sort of visualization driven. And the, at the bottom, there were things such as a donate button and they did track those kinds of things. And they saw such a, they, I remember them saying like, on the one hand, the journalist got on TV in several places to talk about this project. There was actually uh, several other news sites specifically wanted, uh, you know, a, like a little movie with the visualizations in them because that was what they could actually show on their places. It was talked about people and a lot of more people clicked that donate button than they did on other uh, articles, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So there was definitely, hopefully something that all of these data visualizations and these these sort of interactive things that were going on on that article I helped make it more than the typical sort of text only with photos articles that they that they had, I hope. But other than that, it's just, it's really hard. And it's only in terms of a business application, I can only have these anecdotal things where you can say, well, the client was really, you know, they were convinced after they saw your visualization. And then uh, mm -hmm. we were able to explain this thing that we couldn't before, thanks to having made it visual. But it's, yeah, that, that's, I'm afraid that's really where I'm at. I've also been talking with other database freelancers on like, how do you do, you know, do you capture your ROI? Because then, you know, it makes it easier to sell yourself, but it's a tricky life. Yeah. Well, are there other ways that you think about success? Like, you know, obviously an accountant or whoever would be thinking about the literal return on investment in terms of finance. But for you as a, as an artist and as someone working on data visualizations in, in different capacities, what are some of the successes in your mind or what do you look for? Oh, personally, I'm just always so pleased when I get, yeah, and I would silly, when I get emails from people saying that, oh, I, I really enjoyed this piece that you made, or I, I have this other visual about constellations and constellations from other cultures. And I sort of visualize them all at once to see like how different cultures have seen sh like slightly different shapes in the same area of the sky. And it's been amazing to see that uh, like a museum wanted to put, you know, convert that into uh, into some sort of exhibit. And then another one put it into a book and another, uh, I love it when teachers email me, it's like, oh, I want to actually show this to my kids and and make them learn these things. And that to me is sort of, that, those are some of the biggest compliments that I get as an artist, just people actually using it, finding it insightful, learning things that they never did thanks to something that I made visual. And people that tell me that they just think it's, beautiful, like more on my data art sites, like they think they're beautiful. They actually print it and have it hanging in their house. That also feels like very gratifying that they think it's so nice that they will actually, you know, have it become a real thing and have it hanging in their house 24 seven in a way that that's like uh, those two sides is, is what it gives me a lot of joy. Learn a proven approach for solving business problems with data in Pragmatic Institute's Business Driven Data Analysis course. Elevate your impact by improving communication with stakeholders and delivering critical insights. Find out more and enroll at pragmaticinstitute.com slash data. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you're at a sort of intersection between kind of like the, the hard science mathematics and also the, the arts and humanities in terms of, you know, like visual representation and art. I wonder if you see places where things are changing. Like, I mean, I don't want to make this all about AI, but everyone's talking about AI and evolutions in AI. So I wonder how you see that because I, I can imagine like calculations in a sense can become easier with AI. I don't know. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether you think visualizations can become better or easier with AI, or is that something that's not quite there? And yeah, what are your thoughts? Hmm. Well, I think it's not, 
there yet, but I'm definitely see it getting there. I think the AI, I mean, it can definitely help you with uh, data analysis, like the, the like the little charts. If I could just tell AI, it's like make me a bar chart of this versus this, and that instead of actually typing it out, that would be easy. Or just if I can tell the AIs, like if you look at this data set, where are the outliers? Mm -hmm. And also in terms of coding, I sometimes have like <laughs> write me a function that uh, calculates a line line intersection. Like I've, I've done that in the past, but I don't want to do it yet again and again. I can't remember where the code is that I used last time. That makes it really easy. But I think maybe where AI can also help, you know, if it gets a bit smarter uh, or better is, is to help you if they can see how, or if they can somehow put a number maybe on how well understandable the visual is to mm. different kinds of audiences, maybe. It's like if people with this kind of background and, and this kind of setting, uh, this visualization is some such and so understandable or is conveying the data or is not obfuscating yeah. the insights in a, that it can be your sort of um, partner in that sense. Or, But I find it hard to, um, to have it say, like, I wonder if it at some point can tell you Oh, you should actually visualize this number as a circle with the radius as this, and then add like a, a donut chart around it that represents this with an align chart wrapped through it. Who knows what? I think it because how do I say that? I, data visualization is is a lot about the the details. I don't think the AI currently is subtle enough to understand mm -hmm. that 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 it's visualizing data. It's hard to it's hard to say. I mean, the, like the yeah, like there visual. are nuances, right? Yeah, there are, yes, these nuances. And I wonder if it can get there, but, you know, I never would have expected the things that, the th like Dolly and ChatGPT and, and Mitch or Nier are doing. So maybe. maybe I'm just completely wrong. And then maybe, maybe just the fact that there are so fewer data visualizations out there than there are images and text that the mm -hmm. AI just doesn't have enough training data to take over my job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point. I feel like, I mean, yeah, I don't want to like go on record and then next week something comes out that changes everything. <laughs> yeah. That seems to be the way things can go. But yeah, it seems like what you're doing can't, it, you know, it simply can't be replaced by especially narrow AI that is good at doing one thing or another. So I wonder, yeah, how do you see places to partner, partner or use AI? So like you said, thinking about audience and thinking about readability, that could be a really interesting prompt and way to, mm -hmm. to use it. Quick code snippets, of course, makes a mm -hmm. lot of sense. Are there other ways that data visualization professionals might use AI right now? I think inspiration. Like with previous ones, is more towards the tech space, like ChatGPT might help. But I think for inspiration, you can go to something like Dali and Majority. And, and I've tried that. It's like, like I kind of know what I'm looking for, like the space theme, but with a, a slight bit of like this kind of purple and then maybe some Simple, I'm just making some stuff around. Yeah. Like, and then it, then it shows me some results. Like, oh, I like kind of like that style. I mean, it's it's like an artwork of something that I can't use, but I can maybe take the colors, maybe take some of the effects that go, that are going on there, and then um, pull that into my own like data visualization. But actually, to get maybe like I just thought about something where I think that AI has its difficulties with data viz, and that's the hallucinations. So the fact mm -hmm. that it makes up stuff. And what you do not yeah, want not to have in a good data visualization is that it makes up stuff. And I think that, like how I'm not quite sure how that would translate, but I think that's, it's so important for data viz to be correct, like fully mm -hmm. correct that, and yeah, that's, I think that's what I wanted to say. It's like, that's why I'm not sure AI can actually really, is not, not there yet for data viz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course you want to be, you want to be accurate. That's, I think goes without saying. Yeah. I wonder if you're dealing with different kinds of industries or different kinds, like significantly different kinds of audiences, do you have any examples or advice on how you might change a visualization? So if you're looking at one group, you're working one group, say for a week, and then you switch to a very different group, what changes in your visualizations or in the way that you produce them? I do. I mean, in certain groups, I feel like I can then I can assume a higher level of data literacy. So mm -hmm. I, in, in those cases, I can feel that I can add more little things like, and I can, uh, maybe if I have something that has to be very generally understood, I can have a circle and I can have the circles in, in a ring and each circle is differently scaled and that represents something. But if they actually feel like a different audience that has a bigger data literacy, I might, you know, turn each circle into 
I don't in charge, right? I, I, I'm going to connect all of the circles together that have something to say, or like I have something on the outside that points to things. So I will add, I'll try and add more of those like little nuggets of information, more of that hidden metadata that I still have about this data set. I'll put that in. So it's, for me, it comes down to like how much, how much data am I cramming into the same space of pixels in a way that depends mm -hmm. on the audience, but also how, like, it is, it comes down to data literacy, but it also comes down to how much time do I think my audience has to actually look at this visual? I don't want to overload them if they have only a, a little bit of time. And if I know they have a lot of time, I want to, I really want to, you know, take them along on the journey and have it as much as I, as I find interesting in there as well. Yeah. Do you have, do you have time markers in your head? I heard from someone a while ago that there was like, you know, a, a three second, a 30 second and a three minute chart. And those would yeah. be very different, you know, if they think about that and what they want people to get from it. I mm -hmm. wonder if you, yeah, like when you're thinking about that, do you have any quick tips or, or things that you consider? Like, this is going to be something I want people to get within three seconds. This, I hope people will spend 30 seconds looking at or, like, or anything similar. So I don't have specifically, like, I don't think of it in those markets literally, but I think they do play uh, a part in the back of my mind. But it, it still comes down to... If they have three seconds, you can only give them one statistic, really, and so you better make that one better make that one count and make it simple. And if they have the three minutes, you know, it's if they have three minutes and you only represent them with the line chart, it's, it's not. It's usually it's yeah, it's not it's not gonna give them as much story. I think as if uh, if more is added to that to to expand the stories. Like it's if the line chart is just the average of what happened. I mean, there's always layers you can dig deeper and find right. what, where more interesting stuff is. If people have three minutes, they probably want to know more than just that what that one line chart has to has to say. But maybe that's just my way of thinking it. Like I, for me, easily enough, it's really about pulling back the data and looking a level deeper and looking a level deeper and adding adding more of the metadata into the visual channels. Like, like I said, like maybe put a stroke in that represents this and put lines in that represent that and put in mm -hmm another line chart around the circle that represents something that happened across time for that particular circle. It's yeah. So that that's where sort of these, these things fall into place, but yeah, more data, more, more time <laughs> equals more data, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> what about thinking about trends that you've seen over the last few years and what you anticipate? Are there industries you think could be making more use of data, of data viz and are there places maybe within industries or within certain audiences where you see either trends moving into different directions or maybe places where data viz is is going to be more impactful than it has been in the past what do you what do you see in terms of trends oh well interestingly enough about 10 years ago when d3js started and that was really one also a lot probably not the first but one of the first that period of time is when you got interaction in data visualizations. You could hover over something and you get a tooltip and you could click here and things would change. And what we've seen over the past 10 years is that there are only so few people actually click on something to make it change. So is it worth the time investment to actually make that happen? Because that's a lot, a lot of programming to make that yeah. fully dummy proof and, and, and work on all the mobile phones and the desktops. Yeah, yeah. So there's actually been a trend of towards more less interactive visuals and thinking more about if there's interaction, is it really worth it? Like, is this, have I really thought about it instead of just doing it because you can funnily enough. So it's like, it's like, it's like we went over this hill of like extreme interaction and now we're getting yeah. into that, the, the valley of like this is actually useful interaction. And let's see other trends is more. Mm, yeah, that's, it's hard to say. I mean, there was the scrolly telling thing, which happened also a few years ago, where mm -hmm. you could have where the chart stays sort of on the on the page, and then you scroll, the text goes over it, and if the text, for example, goes to a new paragraph, that visual will update in the background, so it's always sort of in sync between the visual and the text. Yeah, you can yeah. have these really nice explorations and explanations from things from that. That's really also a few years old again. I think, but where I hope that things are going in a sense is that companies are understanding that if you want to do really good data visualization, that it's not just not a skill that 
every data scientist has. I mean, they, they, it's not it's not something that everybody just has. It's like a skill that needs to develop and you, you need to work on it. And if you want an expert, you need like an actual database specialist. And these people exist. And I think more companies are realizing that these people exist. And if they want to do like that one visualization for the board where they really need to convince yeah. them, then they hire this, this database person. Sure, there are a few companies that really need like a dedicated one, like the beer companies, and the rest can just hire like an outside freelancer for that one particular particular job. And though, if, I mean, if you do dashboards, it's always good to have an in-house database person, though I, I have to admit. And I think that's what more companies are realizing. It's like database is a specialism. It's not an add-on to other specialisms. Yeah. Yeah, I think as you say that, I was just thinking like if if you're somebody who's working with data experts of any kind and you're thinking like, I know these charts or these visualizations could be better, but they don't know how to say that or they don't have the vocabulary. What would you encourage them to think about or how might they say that in a way that's more effective than telling your data engineer, I want better viz, I want better data viz? Like what would you actually look for? What would you say? What would I say? Uh, wait, do you mean sort of how can they communicate better that they want a different data visualization True. Yeah, like some? I'm just thinking like you're you're receiving whatever data viz you're getting, which may be typical Excel charts, like, you know, click, click and make a chart. And yeah. you know that you want, you know that you could do better. You know that your organization could do better. But if you're, you know, a manager doing a product manager, you maybe don't have any data viz background. You wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily have the vocabulary to say what could be better. You just know that things could be better. How yes. would you help work through that? Or what would you tell people to actually maybe look for or think about? Well, I mean, if they if they were to come to me and ask me, like, I know this can be better. Uh, how should yeah. it be better? The first thing I will ask is sort of what are you looking for from this visual? What insight are you f trying to find from this visual and then you know and then i will ask them is it actually giving you that insight are you are you having finding that piece of information and if it's if it's not then you know that like okay so apparently we need a different way to visualize this data to actually give you that insight if it is if it is actually showing them the insight that they want to get from it i need to dig deeper and understand like why do you think this should be better is it is it not showing you the subtleties enough is it you know is it too high level do we need to go uh, add a little bit more metadata to this visualization to, to also visualize the nuances or is it the design aspect? Is it too boring right now? Is it, is it a bit too creative? Is, so it's, it's you have all of these sort of, it's like this, this flow chart of like possible ways and you're trying to mm. cross off different ways until you find the place where, where that person actually has the difficulties with. But I think like me as that person, I can ask these things like, is it, the inside is it the design? Is it the subtleties? Is like that's what I then bring. Like I know which of these questions to ask to make, to try and hone in on what is is the thing that is wrong with it, and he doesn't quite know where to even look for that yet. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then so to wrap up a little bit and to bring things together, people listening to this who want to take action, who want to improve. Maybe they're a small org or maybe they're huge and they have uh, people in the company already doing some kind of data viz. What are two things that they could do today after listening to this podcast that would have an effect, that would see change, whether that's you know to improve the data viz or to maybe reach out and think about hiring somebody? What are two things that they could do to see effective change or improvements? Well, on the one hand, they could realize... Like, this is a really important data visualization. I need to hire someone from the outside, like especially for this particular visualization that is going to come in the next month. But if it's more in uh, on the like in-company thing, my favorite piece of advice is basically to create, like if you are that database, if you want to do better database, create more database. And, and instead of then try and make something different on each one of them, then... Um, that's sort of a, a two-way part to my other piece, like a, a two and a half piece of advice is, <laughs> is uh, inspiration, a look for inspiration. So I have Pinterest boards. I, when I see something on X or Instagram or as somewhere uh, show up that I think is, is interesting, beautiful, I will put it into a Pinterest board. And I mean, you can, you don't have to curate these themselves, maybe look at some others or go just Google, but look for things that you find beautiful. It's like, oh, this 
like I need to pick a line chart, but um, but this one is looking ugly. Like Google for line line chart design on Pinterest or on Google and look at the ones it's like, oh, I like this one. Why do I like it? Oh, it has curved lines instead of jagged lines. Let's see if I can make them curved as well. So try and and try and get better. Bad in baby steps in a way. Just, you know, don't expect to do everything that like a pro designer can do, but just pick out the things that you think you can do, even if it takes a, an hour of Stack Overflow or asking other people. And the next time, maybe you can add that gradient that I talked about. Like it's it's a small steps, but try try and understand why other th- why you think other people's things are beautiful and be inspired by what other people have done. Don't copy, but remix. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome advice. And also in terms of inspiration, if people want to follow you and your work, Natalie, where can people follow you? Yes. So I have a website, visualcinnamon.com, because, you know, my my name is impossible to (laughs) spell. And on that, you can have, there's a newsletter, which usually I would say, I would have said like, I'm Nadi Bremer on X and Blue Sky and Instagram, but I feel like nobody's seeing what's happening on there anyway. So I have a newsletter that you might want to sign up for. And then maybe, you know, maybe four times a year, you get like the latest stuff that I've been doing uh, updated. No, that sounds great. I'm sure people will want to follow you after listening to this. So, I mean, that's a lot of great advice, even if it's as simple as just challenging yourself to do a little bit better with your data viz after listening Mm -hmm. to what what you've talked about today. I think, uh, yeah, it'll make a big difference for a lot of different teams. Nadia, I want to thank you so much for talking to me today. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you. And then thank you for asking such great questions. 